When in mid-1936 the German Ministry of Propaganda released these pictures of the new Luftwaffe in action, the German air arm was officially just over one year old. It was only in March 1935 that Adolf Hitler had felt sufficiently confident in the strength of the Nazi regime for him to openly declare the existence of an air force that had been denied to Germany under the terms of the Versailles Peace Treaty. In reality, however, all he was doing was to publicly affirm a process that had been ongoing since the Nazi takeover of power. For within days of his becoming Chancellor in January 1933, Adolf Hitler had sanctioned the secret building of a new German air force. Thus, by the time it was officially unveiled, the Luftwaffe could already boast a strength of nearly 2,000 aircraft and some 20,000 men. Significantly, one of the main types of aircraft shown to illustrate the growing power of Germany's bomber wings was already in the process of being phased out by the Luftwaffe, even as this film was being made. The Dornier DO-23, a development of its dangerous forebear, the DO-11, was also deemed to be a failure with production of the type beginning and ending in the previous year. Although some 210 machines of this purpose-designed bomber were built, its performance was so poor that the Luftwaffe increased production of the bomber version of the Junkers 52 transport in preference. Furthermore, prototypes of new second-generation bombers were already being tested. Such matters were of little consequence, however, to the makers of this film, whose primary concern in showing the type in action was to communicate the image of an already powerful and effective Luftwaffe, both in Germany and beyond. In this they succeeded, for 1936 sees the beginning of genuine concern within British and French military intelligence about the growth and potential of the new Luftwaffe. The death in June 1936 of General Weber, the first Luftwaffe chief of staff, was to have a major impact on the bombing arm, believing, as he did, the need for the Luftwaffe to possess a long-range bomber able to reach Scotland and the Urals from Germany. Dornier's response was the DO-19, which first flew in October 1936. The four low-powered engines permitted a maximum speed of just under 200 miles an hour and a range of 994 miles, carrying a moderate bomb load. Taking to the air some months later was the Junkers Ju-89. It also mounted four engines and had a similar performance to the DO-19. However, with Weber's death, the writing was on the wall for these two projects. In April 1937, Luftwaffe Commander Hermann Göring and General de Flieger Erhard Milch endorsed the recommendation of the new Luftwaffe Chief of Staff to cancel the Ural bomber project. Both were concerned that building a heavy bomber force would detract from construction of the larger number of twin-engine bombers. The air staff, however, continued to demand a four-engine heavy bomber, for which Heinkel was issued a contract to build the HE-177 in 1937. Entering service with the Luftwaffe in the summer of 1936 and serving alongside the DO-23 and Ju-52 in the Kampfergruppen was the Junkers Ju-86. As with a number of other bomber types, this aircraft had been flown originally in the guise of a civilian airliner for service with the Deutsche Lufthansa. Production of the bomber variant began in late 1935, with KG-152 being its first recipient, although those seen in this film belonged to the bomber unit named for General Weber following his death. Although employing the characteristic Junkers double wing flaps, the Ju-86 most unusual claim to fame lay in the employment of UMO diesels for power plants. The bomber variant introduced the extensively glazed nose the under-fuselage dustbin gun position, which was lowered only when in flight. Although developed for other specialized roles, the Ju-86 bomber was quickly phased out, ending its days as a training type and emergency transport aircraft in Russia. Although first developed to satisfy a Lufthansa specification for a high-speed transport, the narrow fuselage of Dornier's DO-17 led to it being rejected as an airliner whereupon it was taken up by the Air Ministry for adoption as a bomber. Dubbed the Flying Pencil, the DO-17 was also developed as a recce type. Both the Bomber E and the Recce F models were powered by twin 750 horsepower 
BMW inline engines which gave then a good turn of speed. In its primary role, the 17E carried a very moderate bomb load of just 1,650 pounds and had a range of just over 600 miles. Maximum speed of this variant was some 220 miles an hour. By the end of 1937, four Camp Geschwada had equipped with the type and the decision was taken to send a number to Spain for service with the Condor Legion. The high speed of the DO-17s allowed them to range across Spanish skies with impunity. By mid-1938, the arrival of faster Soviet-supplied fighters saw this advantage leech away. The DO-17E was extensively photographed throughout this period, especially when on manoeuvres with the Army. Fitting radial engines to the type saw the emergence of the DO-17M and P variants. These began to replace the earlier models of the DO-17 in the bomber and recce units from 1938 onwards. On September the 19th, 1938, Luftwaffe strength returns indicated that 479 of all models of the DO-17 were serving with frontline units. The redesigned DO-17Z, introduced in 1939, had a deeper forward fuselage and heavier defensive armament. One of the most influential German aircraft to emerge in the interwar years was the Heinkel HE-70. Adopted by the Luftwaffe, it was used mainly for reconnaissance. Many of its features were employed in the design of the Heinkel 111, the type that provides the defining image of the Luftwaffe bomber at war. In essence, a scaled-up HE-70, it retained the same elliptical wings and fuselage design. The first prototype was flown as early as February 1934. Entering Luftwaffe service in late 1936, in 1937, 30 HE-111Bs were dispatched for combat testing to Spain. From 1937 through 1939, further variants of the design left the production lines. These were identified as the E, F and J models. It was, however, only with the introduction of the Daimler-Benz-powered Model P to Luftwaffe bomber units in early 1939 that the type was to acquire the very distinctive glazed and asymmetric nose that was to characterize the type until taken out of production in the autumn of 1944. The HE-111 was to be encountered on every front on which the Luftwaffe operated between September 1939 and the end of the conflict. Though obsolescent long before, in the absence of a suitable replacement, the Heinkel 111 soldiered on as both bomber and transport, flying its very last operational sorties quite literally in the closing days of the war. Although the Model P remained in limited production through to early 1940, it was the UMO-powered Model H series, extending to some 23 subtypes, which was to become the most numerous of all the HE-111 models to see service. The first H-1 only entered Luftwaffe service in May 1939, but so rapid was the production of this variant that no fewer than 400 had been delivered by the time Poland was attacked on the 1st of September with over half of all the HE-111s in service on that date being of this mark. Although defensive armament was improved on the H-2, the relatively weak protection afforded by the onboard machine guns and the vulnerability of the type to attack by enemy fighters only became really apparent during the Battle of Britain. Nevertheless, it is true to say that Heinkel's HE-111 was one of the truly classic aircraft designs of the Second World War, and for that reason, it holds an honorable place in the Aviation Hall of Fame. The last of the triumvirate of Luftwaffe medium bomber types to emerge before the onset of the war was the Junkers 88. First taking to the air in December 1936, the type nevertheless experienced a fairly long gestation period, with the first production model, JU-88A1s, only reaching frontline Luftwaffe squadrons just before the onset of war. Although the JU-88 had its fair share of teething problems, the Luftwaffe was keenly aware of the very great potential exhibited by the design. Indeed, the JU-88 was to emerge as the most versatile of all the aircraft to serve with the Luftwaffe in the Second World War, operating in a myriad of different and diverse roles. 
Although belonging to a later generation than its stablemates, the DO-17Z and the HE-111, the JU-88 nevertheless retained features in its design common to all three, which can be identified as distinctively Germanic. The most obvious of these was the tendency to group the crew together in the nose and behind extensive glazing. It was here that the bomber's defensive armament was also concentrated. In the case of the JU-88A1, this comprised just three 7.9mm MG-15 machine guns. One fired through the front canopy, one was operated from the rear of the canopy, and the other fired rearward from the under-fuselage nose gondola. Combat revealed this to be inadequate, and in the later A5 and A4 models, this was significantly increased. In keeping with the enthusiasm for dive bombing espoused by some quarters of the Luftwaffe, the Ju-88 was one of the largest aircraft used by the Germans capable of carrying out this task. No aspect of its design, allied to a bomb load and range which mirrored that of the HE-111 and DO-17Z, better exemplifies the planned role of the Luftwaffe bomber force on the eve of war as being to service the tactical requirements of the German army. Early on the morning of August the 26th, 1939, the commanders of Luftwaffe units belonging to Air Fleets 1 and 4, under the commands of Generals Kesselring and Lure, spread out on airfields in East Prussia and in Pomerania and Silesia, were flashed the secret call sign Ostmarkflug. This somewhat prosaic reference to an eastern border cross-country flight was the instruction for them to begin final preparation of their units for the launch of Fall Weiss, the code name for the German invasion of Poland, due to begin on the 1st of September. Over the next few days, Luftwaffe ground crew, nicknamed the Black Men after the colour of their overalls, worked round the clock to prepare their charges for the coming conflict. Bombs were loaded, guns checked and ammunition stored. On the eve of the attack on Poland, all remaining aircraft were deployed to their forward operating bases. Final confirmation of the attack came in the early hours and by the break of day pilots and their crew were entering their aircraft in readiness for the green light to begin the aerial assault on Poland. Of the 1600 aircraft assembled by the Luftwaffe for the invasion of Poland, some 400 comprised Heinkel 111s, KGs 1, 26 and 27 and Leergeschwader 1 operated with Air Fleet 1 with only KG-4 equipped with Heinkels serving with the 4th Air Fleet. Of the four DO-17Z equipped bomber wings, KG's 2 and 3 operated under the auspices of Air Fleet 1 and KG-76 and 77 with Air Fleet 4. In total, 319 serviceable DO-17Zs were employed in the aerial assault. Primary targets of the medium and dive bombers on the opening days of the assault were the Polish airfields. Although the term Blitzkrieg would be coined by the Anglo-French allies to describe the form of warfare now unleashed by the Wehrmacht on the hapless Poles, it was nevertheless appreciated by the Germans that the destruction of the enemy air force in the opening days of the conflict was the key to securing a rapid victory. So it was the opening assaults by the bomber wings of the Luftwaffe were targeted on Polish airfields. The first DO-17 sortie of the war took place when at 05.30 hours, the staffel from KG-3 took off from an airbase in East Prussia to attack the approaches to the railway bridge at Dershau. All other DO-17 staffel were winging their way eastward to destroy the Polish air force. HE-111 units, including a number still using the earlier P variant, were involved in heavy bombing raids on Polish air bases from Lemberg through to Krakow. The Heinkels of LG-1 and KG-27 targeted Warsaw on the opening day of the war. The intensity of operation saw a rapid turnaround of the bombers when they returned to their bases. With command of the air established within a few days, the bomber Geschwade were used to support the operations of the army, bombing bridges, railway yards and troop concentrations. 
They were also employed in the heavy bombing of Warsaw. While they had performed well, the bombers had nevertheless suffered losses. Approximately 78 medium bombers were lost in the campaign, a larger number of HE-111s becoming casualties than the DO-17s. On the 10th of May 1940, German forces invaded France and the Low Countries. The German strategy was to entice Allied forces to advance from their positions along the Belgian border into the country itself and take up positions to block what they believed to be the main German thrust coming through Holland and northern Belgium. A second German thrust comprising the bulk of the armour was to cross the river Meuse and make for the Channel coast and cut off the Allied forces in Belgium from France. A key element in the German plan was to be played by the Luftwaffe. Almost all of the DO-17 and HE-111 bomber wings were involved, amounting to some 1120 aircraft. Pilots had been awakened in the very early hours to be briefed for the first time on their targets. The day had broken with a massive strike by all bombers against airfields in Holland, Belgium and France. Many Allied aircraft were caught on the ground. RAF Blenheim bombers of 114 Squadron based at Convro to the south of Reims were caught in this fashion. DO-17s roared across the airfield dropping their bombs and destroying six of the squadron's 18 bombers. As on many other airfields, they had made easy targets being lined up wingtip to wingtip. The remaining 12 were rendered unusable for combat operations. Throughout the day, the raids against airfields continued, some 50 beyond Paris being struck by Heinkels and Dorniers. Nevertheless, sufficient Allied fighters had survived the first strikes to make life difficult for the bombers. The scenes of destroyed and abandoned equipment littering the beaches of Dunkirk and shown to German audiences on the weekly newsreel did not tell the whole story. In the skies over Dunkirk, RAF hurricanes and Spitfires had inflicted worrying losses on the Kampfergruppen. The medium bombers had revealed themselves to be vulnerable and lacking in defensive firepower. In consequence of the losses inflicted by RAF fighter command, participating bomber formations had shared the same fate as the Stukas and seen their numbers shrink by 50%. In the euphoria of the victory over France, the experience of the bombers over Dunkirk and the lessons to be drawn were forgotten, only to be forcibly relearned even more painfully in the skies over Great Britain. The second phase of the Western Campaign began in early June with a major offensive by the Germans against the French positions on the line of the rivers Aisne and Somme. This had been preceded in familiar fashion by further massive airstrikes by the Luftwaffe. Under the codename of Operation Paula, the Luftwaffe struck at all the still employable airfields of the French Air Force on June the 3rd. The results were devastating. Surviving French air power was effectively wiped out. The German Air Force now flew through the skies of France with impunity and were once more able to turn their full attention to supporting the ground operations. Devastating attacks were made on the French defensive positions and, in conjunction with the Panzers, the Aisne and Somme lines had been breached by the 10th of June. Newsreel cameramen flying with the bomber crews now captured sorties by HE-111s as they flew over Paris and attacked the huge railway marshalling yards to the south of the city. Flying above the railway lines, the Heinkels now searched for targets of opportunity, strafing and bombing anything that seemed to have any military value. Paris was occupied on June the 10th and the German advance pushed southward. The French forces were showing all the signs of disintegration. Operations ended with the armistice signed at Compiègne on June the 22nd.
Although German air operations had begun sometime before the 10th of August 1940, Goering was, however, on hand to witness the start of Adler Tag, or Eagle Day, which was the designated date for the formal beginning of the aerial campaign against Great Britain. Even so, it was some two days later that the campaign began in earnest. Seeing combat for the first time in significant numbers was the new JU-88A1. On the 12th of August, 63 JU-88s from KG-51 Edelweiss bombed Portsmouth. On the 15th, 50 belonging to KG-30 flew from their base in Denmark and attacked the RAF air base at Driffield. Of the three bomber types employed by the Luftwaffe, the Ju-88 was undoubtedly the most effective, but that observation was only relative, for it too was discovered to be as vulnerable as the HE-111 and the Dornier 17 to fighter attack by the RAF. Luftwaffe's strategy at this time was to target RAF airfields in order to pin down and destroy the assets of fighter command. Initially, such raids were undertaken by the bombers without the close protection of the Bf-109s of the Jagdwaffe. In the early stages of the battle, they were encouraged to engage in hunt-and-kill missions against RAF fighters. When the latter attacked the bombers, their lack of protective armor and poor defensive firepower made them highly vulnerable. Losses among the Kampfergruppen began to mount. On September the 7th, Goering was once more standing on the cliffs at Camp Blancnay, but this time to watch his bombers sweep overhead to begin the campaign against London. Switching the bombers from attacking the airfields to hitting London may have been good for propaganda, but was a strategic error of the first order. The RAF were thus given the breathing space to recoup its losses and prepare for the next round. On Goering's instructions, the fighters now attended closely to the vulnerable bombers, but the limited range of the Bf-109 prevented them giving their larger and slower charges protection to the target and all the way back again. Vectored onto the incoming German raids by radar, the British fighters often waited for the 109s to turn back before hitting the bombers. The 15th of September witnessed the climax of the air battle. The first large-scale Luftwaffe raid was made in the morning, but was met by a very large number of Spitfires and Hurricanes as it neared London just before midday. The German formation, composed almost exclusively of DO-17s, was broken up and did not hit London in any strength. A second raid in the afternoon by a very large number of bombers was met by 170 RAF fighters. The German fighter escort was unable to prevent the Spitfires and Hurricanes shooting down the bombers. Although Luftwaffe raids continued, they never thereafter matched the pitch of the 15th of September. Two days later, on the 17th, the British intercepted and decoded a signal from the OKW ordering the dismantling of invasion transport facilities in Holland. This was the first indication that Operation Sea Lion, the code name for the proposed invasion of Britain, had been cancelled indefinitely. Goering now had time to rue the cost of a strategic air campaign waged by an instrument that was not designed for, nor was up to, the task. In a report from the office of Ernst Udet, the quartermaster general of the Luftwaffe, he pondered the figures that gave a detailed breakdown of Luftwaffe losses between the 3rd of August and the 28th of September. A total of 719 bombers had been lost in that period, as well as 400 of the crews that flew them. For the populace of London, who now endured months of night bombing by the Luftwaffe, the Battle of Britain was still in one sense being fought. By the end of October, less than 100 bombers were being employed in daylight raids. 
nearly all the bomber assets had already been shifted to night raids with 1150 aircraft available for employment. The consequences of the battle were to be profound. The losses to the Luftwaffe bomber arm were never made good. As important as the losses in aircraft were those of aircrew, many of whom were veteran flyers and whose expertise would soon be sorely missed. Furthermore, it was his failure to defeat Britain that turned Hitler's gaze eastwards towards Russia. While the newsreel shows an affable and amiable Reich Marshal visiting his men in France and awarding them medals for the valiant service, it is clear that his personal prestige and that of the Luftwaffe had taken a tumble in Hitler's eyes. There is also little doubt that the defeat had an effect on Goering as well. He was never keen on the war and expressed views in September 1939 that suggest that he remained in himself unconvinced that Germany could win. In his subsequent withdrawal of interest from the Luftwaffe and his ever deeper self-indulgences, there was perhaps exhibited the character of one who already believed he saw the writing on the wall for Germany. Essential to the planning of any major bombing raid was the availability of up-to-date intelligence of the target. The provision of photo reconnaissance units in the Luftwaffe had been built into its organization from the beginning. The first aircraft employed for the role was the Heinkel HE-70. This was replaced by the DO-17 from 1937 onwards. This aircraft made way in turn for the specialized photo recce variant of JU-88A1. This Junkers aircraft was regarded by the Luftwaffe as the jewel in its crown. Derived from the A1 bomber variant, the photo recce type began to enter service in small numbers with the Alf Klarungsgruppe in 1940. Others were attached to the standard bomber Gruppen. The advantage of the Ju-88 in this role was its relatively high speed and fairly long range. In this photo recce mission, the Ju-88 flies out over enemy territory to acquire the necessary photo intelligence of the enemy's defences and dispositions. During the flight, the delicate wide aperture lens is protected by a cover which is only withdrawn as the aircraft makes its photo pass over its target. A number of images are rapidly taken and the Ju-88 beats a fast retreat before it can be intercepted by enemy fighters. The keynotes of photo recce operations were and still are speed and stealth. With the task accomplished, the radio operator signals base that the aircraft will be shortly returning with the desired film and to have preparations made for its rapid development. Once the plane has landed, the observer takes the film cartridge out of its housing and having left the aircraft, boards a motorcycle combination. This delivers him and the film under escort to the photographic interpretation center on the airbase. Grasping the film cassette, the soldier now enters the building and prepares to hand it over to the duty officer. Having scrutinized the manifest, the officer takes possession of the film case and passes it on to the labs. The film is then developed by the staff and made into a form suitable for use in the mission planning by a bomber crew. Employing highly detailed maps of the Coventry area, the crew plans its flight to the target. Many of these maps were acquired by Germany before the war, either by open purchase or in secret. In the meantime, the ground crews bomb up the aircraft for the mission. 
HE-111s and JU-88s are being readied for the famous raid on the city of Coventry that took place on the 14th of November 1940. Not seen or even hinted at in this film is the use of X-beams, an early form of electronic guidance system. Under the codename of Moonlight Serenade, the pathfinders of KG-100 drop flares over Coventry beginning at 1920 hours. Over the next 11 hours, 449 German bombers attacked the city. 500 people were killed, over 1,200 injured, and 60,000 buildings destroyed along with the famous cathedral. The attack on Coventry was the Luftwaffe's most devastating raid on any UK target. Admiral Dönitz, officer commanding U-boats, the German occupation of the French Atlantic coast was an event of the greatest significance for the submarine war against Great Britain. Indeed, the first train carrying torpedoes and personnel to support their operations arrived at the Biscay port of Lorient on the day after the signing of the armistice with France, with the first U-boat docking on July the 7th. Late June had also seen the first deployment of Fock Wolf FW200 Condors, belonging to the first staffle of KG40 to the former French airbase at Bordeaux Merignac in support of the U boat campaign. Although not originally intended for Luftwaffe service in the anti shipping and reconnaissance roles, the FW200 had been quickly adopted for these purposes with the earlier than expected outbreak of war in 1939. The Condors flew from Bordeaux out to the west of Ireland and then northwards to land at Trondheim or Stavanger in Norway. Although initially credited by the British with being able to carry a formidable offensive load, in reality the Condor toted a maximum of the five 550-pound bombs seen being loaded by the ground crew. Defensive armament of the C-1 variant comprised of three MG-15 machine guns and one 20mm cannon. With the aircraft fully bombed up and fueled, and the crew briefed with the latest intelligence from Marine Group West at Lorient, the mission began. However, in the first few months, they were employed as part of the Luftwaffe's general campaign against the British Isles, being used to drop bombs on land targets. It was only in August that they were fully switched to the anti-shipping role in support of the U-boat campaign against the convoys carrying vital goods and material from the United States and Canada to fuel Britain's war effort. For the crew, the long flight was helped by the relatively spacious interior of the Condor, a legacy of its origins as a pre-war airliner built for Lufthansa to operate on the long range overseas flights to the USA and elsewhere. With a range of some 2,100 miles, when employing its economical cruising speed of 158 miles per hour, the Condor was able to range far out to the west of Ireland in search of prey. In the absence of air cover for the convoys, poor anti-aircraft defences on the merchant ships and a paucity of naval escorts, the Condors were able to attack the convoys with impunity. In the eight months between August 1940 and February 1941, the Condors of KG-40 accounted for 85 vessels amounting to 363,000 tons of shipping sunk. One of the more spectacular victories was achieved by Oberleutnant Bernhard Jope when on the 26th of October 1940, his Condor damaged the Canadian Pacific liner, the Empress of Britain, of the northwest coast of Ireland its burning hulk later being sunk by U-32. The vulnerability of the convoys in this early period of the war is clearly seen in this film of an attack by a number of condors. In the absence of anti-aircraft fire, the large aircraft are able to approach their targets from low level. Machine gun fire from the side positions is employed to spray the decks of the merchantmen while the gunner in the nose of the gondola, slung under the fuselage of the Condor, turns his destructive 20mm MG-151 cannon on the approaching target. 
Bombs were released at low level to cut down on error, but as can be seen, even this did not guarantee success, for when flying at just over mast height, many bombs failed to land on the moving targets. Such a regime with the Condors flying in this manner lasted through to the summer of 1941, when British countermeasures began to make life more difficult for the predatory Luftwaffe bombers. In addition to mounting anti-aircraft guns, which made the low-level bombing run more hazardous, Condors now also found themselves facing enemy fighter aircraft. It is a measure of the desperate British need to get air cover over the convoys to ward off the Condors that they were even prepared to sacrifice a Hurricane fighter on a one-shot operation. Launched from a catapult at the approach of a Condor, the Hurricane would attack the enemy aircraft, but being unable to land afterwards, the pilot would ditch his aircraft and be rescued as it sank. The first Condor shot down in this fashion was destroyed on the 3rd of August 1941. The appearance of fighters operating from escort carriers also led to relatively high losses to the German type. In spite of Churchill's designation of the Condor as a scourge, its undoubted effectiveness was always hampered by its limited availability. For example, in 1940, just 26 FW200Cs were built, with another 58 completed the following year. The problem of small numbers was compounded by problems inherent to the design of the aircraft. The rapidity with which it had been drafted into service precluded the modifications necessary to strengthen its rear spar, which resulted in many suffering a broken back. The fuel lines that ran along the bottom of the fuselage made it extremely vulnerable to enemy fire. Failure to strengthen the airframe stopped the Condor being able to take evasive action when attacked for fear of airframe failure. The Condors also had the task of transmitting coordinates of the convoys they had attacked or spotted back to U-boat command at Lorient. The aircraft did not broadcast directly to the submarines, from here, the relevant information would then be encrypted, employing Enigma coding machines, and then rebroadcast to the U-boats out in the Atlantic. Having received and decoded the signal, the U-boats would proceed to the coordinates of the convoy, making allowances for tide and movement. In practice, the process of vectoring U-boats onto convoys using data sent from the Condors never met with any success. In part, this was because it was not possible for the Navy, who lacked their own spotter planes like the Condor, to manage to coordinate properly with the Luftwaffe. It was in search of this greater harmony that, in January 1941, Dönitz appealed to Hitler, arguing his case for the U-boat arm in the Atlantic, to be given its own eyes. Hitler concurred and subordinated KG-40 and its Condors to his submarine command. This did not go down at all well with Goering. Nevertheless, it was the Condors rather than the U-boats who benefited from this new relationship. On the 9th of February, U-37 sighted convoy HG-53 outbound from Gibraltar and heading home to Britain. The commander of the U-boat, Corvette Capitan Ern, attacked and sank two ships some 160 miles to the southwest of Cape Vincent. He then called Lorient, who dispatched six of KG-40's Condors, which then succeeded in sinking another five of the vessels in the convoy. Ten days later, a Condor called in U-boats to a convoy, and a wolf pack was formed up which dispatched three ships, with the Condors sinking a further nine. However, the results for such cooperation never truly realised Dernitz's expectations. After all the action, it was time for the crew to relax on the homeward leg of the flight. A more carefree atmosphere now pervades the aircraft as the stress of combat gives way to the relief of exhaustion and the prospect of landfall in Norway. After an exceptionally long flight from bordeaux Merignac, the Condor gets ready to make its final approach into Trondheim. Flying over the base, the Condor waggles its wings in the best fighter tradition to indicate its success in achieving a kill. 
Visible on the forward fuselage just under the canopy is the World in a Ring insignia carried by Condors serving with KG-40. A number of those Condors making this round trip to Norway would soon find themselves being stationed permanently in that country from 1942 onwards to help combat the convoys sailing from Britain to Murmansk. The crew disembark to be greeted by ground crew. Once the victory tally is known, one of the ground crew takes his paint and brush to mark the latest victory of this condor on its tailplane. It is a measure of the optimism of most of the senior German commanders that the war would remain short that when the invasion of Russia was launched on June the 22nd, 1941, they appeared unconcerned that the bomber arm had 200 fewer aircraft on strength than on the eve of the Western campaign one year before. Not only had German bomber production failed to keep pace with losses during this period, but no attempt had been made to expand output to actually increase the number of bombers available for operations. Nor did the opening weeks of the Eastern campaign do anything other than reinforce this conviction. Such was the pace and success of the German advance that even Franz Halder, the army chief of staff, was to write in early July that all seemed to be over in the east already and that Hitler had been right after all in stating that only six weeks would be needed to defeat Russia. For the Luftwaffe, this period was one of unbridled success. The 90 bomber staffel committed to the attack were distributed between Air Fleets 1, 2 and 4. They were employed in the same fashion as in Poland and the West. June the 22nd had witnessed massive raids by DO-17s, JU-88s and HE-111s on the priority target of Soviet airfields. All of those in Western Russia had been secretly photographed in spy flights by high-flying recce aircraft in the months before the attack. In order to ensure that most of the vast number of aircraft deployed on these fields were destroyed at the outset of the campaign, Luftwaffe bomber formations crossed into Soviet territory at great height to ensure that they arrived over their targets at 03.15 hours and at the very moment the German army crossed the frontier. The subsequent destruction of Soviet aircraft was very great, but such were their numbers that during the second wave of strikes, German bombers were assailed by large numbers of enemy fighters that had survived the first. Nevertheless, by the end of June, the Luftwaffe had gained air supremacy over the northern and central sectors and air superiority in the south. Nevertheless, problems for the bomber formations began to mount. The further they moved eastward, the more thinly spread out they became and the more difficult it was for them to be supplied. In addition, a major constraint on their effective use was the manner in which they had become tied to Army's apron strings. Given the lack of sufficient numbers of the ground support types, such as the Stuka, the medium bombers were employed instead as substitutes, becoming mere adjuncts of the army, employed as flying artillery, as Adolf Gallant put it. However, for the newsreel cameramen of the propaganda department attached to the advancing ground forces, the scenes of massive destruction of Soviet forces and equipment, such as that seen here, and which was attributed to the bombers of the Luftwaffe, made good copy for sending back to Germany. Indeed, these scenes were repeated on many occasions, as the bombers were tasked to destroy railway stations and trains in sidings, troop concentrations, artillery positions, and assault the huge columns of the retreating Red Army. When shown on the weekly Wochenschau in the cinemas in the Fatherland, such powerful images did much to foster a sense of optimism among the populace, that the war in the East would indeed be soon over. Yet the triumphalist mood communicated by the propaganda department was not mirrored by the Luftwaffe bomber commanders. Serious concern was being expressed at the way the scale and pace of operations was resulting in high bomber losses. The four Heinkel 111 Gruppen in action in Russia by the end of July could deploy only 128 serviceable bombers on August the 16th. 
total numbers of this type operating in all theatres was just 190 machines. Such was the level of operational attrition. As significant were the high numbers of valuable aircrew lost by having the medium bombers employed on operations for which they had not been designed. Losses among the approximately 400 JU-88s available on June the 22nd had also been high. In short, the bomber units were being worn down by accumulation of factors. Losses through combat attrition, a rise in the unserviceability of machines brought about by the pace of operations, and constant shifting of bomber units from one sector to another. Ad hoc airfields on unsuitable terrain led to damage to the undercarriages of many bombers, factors compounded by the great stress being placed upon the overstretched transport arm. In early August, the head of the Luftwaffe, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, was captured on the newsreel visiting a headquarters on the Eastern Front. There to greet him was Field Marshal von Brauschitz, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army. Although appearing to be outwardly smiling and optimistic, Goering was not a happy man. He was one of the very few senior military and party figures who had openly expressed his profound doubts about the wisdom of invading Russia to Hitler. Throughout early 1941, and right up until the very last minute, he had dogged the Fuhrer and tried to get him to change his mind. Once the plan for the invasion of Russia was revealed, he also expressed his view that it was unlikely that the USSR could be defeated in the six-week period Hitler had allowed for the campaign. In one of his final attempts to change Hitler's mind, he stated that the ground forces can't fight any more without Luftwaffe support. They're always screaming for the Luftwaffe. There's nothing I'd like better than to see you proven right, but frankly, I doubt that you will be. Goering clearly had a better grasp of matters than did his leader. On the closing day of September, the Germans launched what they expected to be the last phase of the campaign that would see the Soviet Union defeated before the onset of the winter. Codenamed Typhoon, its first objective was the destruction of the bulk of the Soviet armies screening the approaches to Moscow. Thereafter, with the defences in front of the Soviet capital shattered, it was expected to fall swiftly to German armoured columns. So committed to supporting the army had the bomber units been in the opening phase of Barbarossa that it had not the time or the resources to address other strategic targets beyond the main battlefield. So it was not until a month after the invasion of Russia that Moscow experienced its first raid by the Luftwaffe. Drawing on bombers from a number of different Kampgeschwade, approximately 200 HE-111s and JU-88s took off from the airfields in the Smolensk area and headed towards the Soviet capital on the night of the 21st, 22nd of July. The defences of Moscow were well prepared and equipped for the incoming Luftwaffe raid. The capital was surrounded by anti-aircraft guns and a number of Soviet fighter squadrons based on airfields around the city. Alexander Wirth, a British war correspondent serving in Moscow at the time, described how impressive was the anti-aircraft barrage with shrapnel clattering down onto the streets like a hailstorm and dozens of searchlights lighting the sky. He stated that he had never heard or seen anything like it even in London, the Luftwaffe had not expected to encounter such heavy defences. According to Worth, the Soviets claimed that just 10 or 15 planes out of the attacking 200 had broken through. Leading the bombers of KGs 27, 53, 54 and 55 over the city were the pathfinders of Kampfergruppe 100 and 3 KG 26 who dropped flares over the primary targets. According to German sources, which dispute the Soviet claims, most of their aircraft did drop their loads, amounting to 104 tonnes of high explosive and 46,000 incendiary bombs on Moscow itself. This attack was followed by two others over the next two nights, but they were smaller in scale. Moscow was to be attacked, albeit in a desultory fashion, on another 73 occasions by the end of 1941, but these were mainly nuisance raids undertaken by forces comprising 10 bombers or less.
The forward momentum of Operation Typhoon, broken by three weeks of rain and mud in October, finally resumed with the onset of the frost and snow in November. The German army struggled forward in the face of growing cold and exhaustion and supported by a declining Luftwaffe. In October, the numbers of bombers available for combat had fallen to 40%. Figures for fighters and dive bombers were only marginally better. As the infantry wrapped themselves up in whatever was to hand to protect themselves from the penetrating cold, and the panzers clanked their way across the frozen earth, every mile nearer the Soviet capital brought with it the undeniable evidence of the growing strength of a revived Soviet air force. Nor was the ability of the Luftwaffe to assist the offensive, aided by Hitler's decision to withdraw bomber groups from Russia and dispatch them to Sicily. Within days of the final collapse of Typhoon, the Soviets went over to the counter-offensive before Moscow, inflicting on the Wehrmacht its first great defeat of the war. Between early December and the end of the winter, the German forces in the line before Moscow came perilously close to destruction. Although short-range battlefield reconnaissance sorties were still undertaken by the Henschel HS-126, longer-range photographic coverage of enemy positions was carried out by the JU-88Ds of the Alf Klarungsgruppen. This example has arrived back at its airfield with the latest photos of Soviet dispositions. In the photographic interpretation section, the pictures are developed and then studied. From the information drawn from the images, orders are then sent to the bomber unit. Junkers 88s belonging to KG-51 are prepared for combat by their black men. Working in such freezing conditions where the temperatures could fall to minus 40 degrees made such a task quite appalling. However, during the course of the winter of 1941-42, the desperate military situation made it essential for the Luftwaffe to be able to support the army in the face of the Soviet winter offensive. The JU-88s take off and head for their targets across a desolate, snowy landscape. In Russia, the once proud bombing arm of the mighty Luftwaffe would, in the months and years to come, be slowly bled white. 